Well, hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 530th New Social Environment. I'm Nick, the Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Siobhan Liddell, Linda Madelon, Ksenia M. Sobaleva, and Will Corwin on the occasion of the current exhibit on view at Candace Mady through April 16th. We're thrilled to welcome poet Ty Cooper here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a working document of resources and actions. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we do need your support. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, and production staff and operations here at The Rail. Please check the chat for more information and links to donate. But now to introduce today's guests and host, painter and sculptor Siobhan Liddell deals with space between knowing and unknowing, the mystery in the everyday, history, and the continuum of desire to record and create our unique worlds. She is the recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation Award and the recipient of the Rome Prize Feralist Fellowship 2011-2012. She is represented by Gordon Robichaud in New York. Artist Linda Madelon's drawings and sculpture have been described as an unflagging effort by turns dogged, tender, angry, and amused, amused to wrestle pure vision into tangible form. Madelon has received grants from the New York Foundation for the Arts and Art Matters, among others. She is represented by Cato Wilborn in Dusseldorf. Ksenia M. Sobaleva is a writer, art historian, and curator based in New York City and specializes in queer art and culture. She was the 2020-21 uh, Marika and Jan Vilcek Curatorial Fellow at the Guggenheim Museum and is currently an Andrew W. Mellon Gender and LGBTQ Plus History Fellow Center for Women's History at the New York Historical Society Museum and Library. And last but certainly not least, we have sculptor and journalist William Corwin, who has written regularly for the Brooklyn Rail, Art Papers, Bomb, Art Critical, among others. Most recently, he curated and wrote the catalog for post-war women at the Art Students League in New York, an exhibition of the school's alumni active between 1945 to 65. And um, we will be posting links to more details for each of our guests in the chat. But without uh, further ado, Will, over to you. Hey. Um, so it's a tremendous honor to, to be able to talk to these artists um, and, and their curator. Um, the show currently at Candace Mady Fragments, which uh, is Siobhan Liddell and Linda Madelon's wonderful work. Um, I visited the show last week and uh, there's this sort of incredibly uh, moving and uh, lyrical quality about it. It's about mourning, it's about uh, friendship, it's about love. Um, and the work all takes that into account. Um, so I guess the first question is to Cassinia, which is just how did this project come about? How did you find these two artists uh, and, and bring, you know, and, and coordinate this exhibition? So that's always the, the, the interesting, you know, thing to start with. Thank you, Will, and thank you to everyone at the Book on Rail. It's such a pleasure to be here and to be on the other side of a posting. Um, Nick, I think you can you can pull up the slideshow now so that we can just look at a, at a few images of the show as I as I talk. But um, the show really draws from um, my dissertation, which uh, is titled "Fragments: Art, AIDS, and Lesbian Identity." Uh, I pulled it out of the closet, please. Uh, art, AIDS, and Lesbian Identity in the United States from 1986 till 1996. And one of the things that I was interested in exploring in the dissertation uh, were the more subtle and abstract and metaphoric registers through which lesbian identified artists uh, respond, responded to the AIDS crisis. And those artworks have rarely been placed in that context. And um, you know, especially at the, at the time, there was such an emphasis on uh, work that was um, legibly political, which, which was understandable. Um, but I guess I I had become very interested in 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 the silence in silence is death, which you know is is an emblematic slogan of AIDS activism, and of course references 
government silence and neglect. Um, but I viewed it, I was interested in approaching it as a larger theme. And um, I always think about Bastian Ader's uh, video piece, I'm Too Sad to Tell You, from 1971. And he made it like four years before he mysteriously disappears at sea. And in the video, you see him just uncontrollably weeping. And every time he stops and he's trying to say something, he just starts crying again. And so just the title alone, I'm too sad to tell you, just implies this, this grief that, that is so strong that it disables speech and disables certain ways of communicating. Um, and I, um, I wanted to think more about that and to think about the quiet side of grief and, and, and the quiet side of, uh, of anger and um, artworks that reflect that sentiment, you know, that, that, that weren't representational, that weren't legibly political, um, but were still very meaningful responses to the AIDS crisis um, and reflected a palpable absence and, and a heightened sense of mortality and just loss, really. Um, and that, that is such an intrinsic part of a fragment as well, right? The fact that you have a fragment of something means that something else has been lost. And so the dissertation is titled Fragments because my writings are only fragments of a much larger narrative. And also because lesbian identity has been represented through fragments. Um, and then the show is a fragment of the dissertation. <laughs> And then, and then fragments as an aesthetic strategy that many artists during the AIDS crisis uh, were employing, including Linda and Siobhan. And so I'm gonna stop talking soon, but <laughs> basically uh, the last chapter of the dissertation is centered ar around Linda. And then I got to know Siobhan as I was finishing the dissertation and I just instantly saw this dialogue between them. Um, and I was sad that I didn't get to you know, fully explore that in the dissertation. So I wanted to do something else. And then I was talking to Candace Maddy, um, who's just the most wonderful human being um, in November. <laughs> and I said, I want to do this show. And she said, you should do it here. And then I went to Linda and Siobhan and I said, let's do a show. It'll be in two months. <laughs> and they both agreed. And um, I think that speaks to also the friendship between us. Um, and the rest is history. Yeah. I think picking up on that note, um, the title fragments, you know, many of the works are examples of, uh, of traces, uh, especially the drawings where you have sort of just, you know, smudges and lines, uh, the works that are the drawings that aren't sort of study actual sculptures. And then many of the sculptures, the bronze pieces, um, by Vaughn, are uh, spaces between people. And, and so the idea of fragments and traces, what I'm very curious about sort of from a historical point of view is I want like to hear Siobhan and, and, and Linda's narrative just you know briefly in terms of what was your experience at that point in the, in the mid eighties and the mid nineties. I know that Linda's from Brooklyn and, uh, and Siobhan is from the UK. So, what were your, you know, I guess starting with Siobhan, what were your experiences in New York right then? And how did you kind of lay this groundwork for, for creating these works? And, and, and what were your interactions with loss? And, and who did you lose? I'm very curious about that, if you're, if you're willing to talk about that a bit. I, I, I guess start with Siobhan and, and sort of coming to New York and what your experience was. Um, well, I... Um... I arrived in New York around 1986 after finishing art school in London. And I, I kind of had friends who invited me and I was definitely interested in leaving London and exploring New York. Um, I also had, you know, the AIDS crisis was, beginning or it had begun, but it was not as, um, you know, talked about in England or in London. It was a sort of, you know, maybe a stiff upper lip attitude. 
But anyway, coming to New York, um, there was a crossover of friends and people that I knew who had come to London and then were here. And, you know, well, talking about people who I lost is gonna be hard for me and I'm gonna turn into the too sad to tell you because also right now there's been a lot of loss. So um, I don't think I can quite get into that right now. Um, but it was devastating in New York at the time. And um, I guess after arriving, I, I sort of fell into being the assistant at Robert Gober Studio, which, you know, um, was kind of, you know, he was in the midst of his crisis. We were, you know, living um, and working really. I mean, I was living um, with a man called Charles Wells who was very active in ACT UP. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, we made posters, we made, we made things together there um, in this loft. We lived all the way downtown in Trinity Place and, um, yeah, I think it was something just vital happening. There was no way I wasn't gonna be involved, you know? It was, um, it was a kind of overarching sense of, um, there was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. It was just, we were here, you know? I joined ACT UP, I was, um, you know, I kind of view myself really as a, I'm all, I always sort of feel like I'm looking in as opposed to being in the middle of things. I'm sort of the observer on the outside, but I attended a lot of meetings. I went to a lot of protests, you know. So, um, yeah, maybe Linda, you wanna carry on? Um, I think actually in, Thank you all. Uh, before I thank you for doing this, for inviting, I've been listening to the lunchtime talks and I can't believe I'm actually doing one now. <laughs> um, um, that span from the uh, mid or early 80s to the 90s, actually lots of things, like it was kind of like a really like fast moving time in a way for me. Um, in, in the very beginning, I was in New York. I lived in Brooklyn. I uh, uh, had mostly um, male, gay male friends. And um, so in the very, very beginning, before it was actually called AIDS, like all of a sudden some friends were dying and, um, and the count was so low. It was actually like, you know, there was like, in the two digits, you know, and then it was like three digits and then it was called grid. So there was like this name to it. And then, um, so it was like it, it, and then all of a sudden my whole inner circle of gay male friends were dead. And it was very, um, uh, it was to use Siobhan's term, it was disturbing and kind of confusing and scary. And uh, there were so many people trying to do different things all like at the same time, um, you know, and uh, it was a little, the beginning, it was like chaotic and calm at the same time. Like people were very level-headed and also very like, it was like frenetic. And like these two energies were happening at the same time. And, you know, you found yourself sometimes going to memorial services like every day, you know, like four times a week. Um, like it just seemed like there was this, um, you know, there was this like always something that had to sort of like happen. Um, and uh, it was, and it was for me, it was like a crazy time I had, I had, I had just, you know, cleaning out friends' apartments and, you know, there was things you had to deal with that you never really, you know, like, 
you know, moving companies that didn't want to take things. And like, it was just like this, like very kind of chaotic time, but a time of like trying to always just get to the next step. And it was, um, it was almost almost like there was like no time in public to be feel sad. You were just angry. And so like when I come back home, which I was living and working at, at, in the same studio, at working and living in the same place, um, it was like to come home and to be in the studio for me was a the sort of like a place of like working a lot of this stuff out. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if I went off on a tangent there or not. Um, or answer the question. <laughs> um, like for, I wanted to ask you, Linda, specifically, um, goodbye to all my drag queens. Can you talk talk about that piece a little bit? Sure. Um, Nick, could you go to that slide so that people just aren't sort of like, you, you have something to, uh, instead of just watching me. Um, I think it's the last one, yeah. So, so that piece um, was actually, I made that, I was, uh, a, a fellow at the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. And um, I, I started that. This of a series of these kind of waxy, um, um, you know, uh, pieces that were so kind of literal. I was trying, I kind of like tried to pull away from being so literal. Um, and this is kind of the, the last piece from that series. And, and the, the title is just sort of like, you know, from like, it was like, a, I don't know. It's a very emotional piece for me still. I hadn't seen it. It was borrowed for the exhibition, which I have to say Candace um, really, you know, went to town to get this piece because it was so important to Kesnia and, um, you know, um, they borrowed it out of a collection in New York and I hadn't seen it since I, the 90s. And um, it was kind of shocking to see how, you know, we're kind of still, we're kind of dealing with this again. Like, I mean, I can't kind of believe that we're sort of like, back to this again, you know, in another, in a pandemic. And, um, and so a lot of people at the opening kept thought that I had made this now, like that it was like a piece of, I, and I was like, no, it's from the nineties. And um, it's, it really is kind of my, like, I wanna move on a little bit in my work. Um, and then uh, sort of the, the wire, that the vessels um, kind of came after that, um, so. I guess that's an that's a interesting question to Cassinia as well is, I mean, obviously you began this dissertation well before the pandemic, but it must be sort of quite quite an intense experience to to be writing about this situation in the in the early mid 80s and then kind of doing it under sort of similar conditions of government kind of completely sort of shifting the blame to you know off of its own shoulders and kind of fumbling and bumbling this whole situation i don't know senior what was what was has your experience been in that regard yeah it was it was very uncanny and actually when the pandemic started like the first week that things were had just started closing I was in LA with Gordon Robichaud and Siobhan was there uh, though we didn't know each other that well yet uh, but Frederick Weston was there who has since passed and um, there, there were a lot of queer people and many of them were having like PTSD from the AIDS crisis because they were being told once again that they can't touch, you know, and they can't hug and they can't kiss. And so there was this, um, you know, this palpable panic. And then that was, that was my last um, 
you know, week of socializing before flying back to New York and just <laughs> completely uh, quarantining. And I had just ended a relationship. And so I was just all by myself <laughs> quarantining. And I, I thought this is, um, you know, this is the time to, to finish the dissertation. Um, but it was, um, I will say it was actually, it was helpful because it helped me think through, through a lot. There are, you know, in, in many ways, some of the comparisons that were being made between the pandemic and the AIDS crisis, I didn't fully agree with, and it was frustrating that it was being quite so equated. Mm -hmm. but, but in many ways, I, I, I will say it, it, it did inform my thinking and it did help me better understand um, just, you know, the not knowing and the confusion and um, not trusting a government and, um, you know, how marginalized communities continue to be affected um, by a neglectful government and a, and a failing health system. So, yeah, yeah. But it, it so weird to say, but it was like a, I won't say blessing in disguise, but but it was helpful for me to finish this dissertation during during another pandemic. Yeah, I think it made it better. Hmm. I want to ask a question to Siobhan. Um, there was a certain uh, there's a set of prints in the exhibition, the handprint series, which have a puncture, uh, sort of a circular space in the hand. Um, I, if we can go to that, and uh, and then there's also a piece called glass rods, and both of these deal, I think. At least the handprints deal with a, a study that Siobhan did, I think, while in Rome with the Oculus of the Pantheon. Correct. And, um, and I, I, I find it very interesting, Siobhan, that like one of the, you, you seem to be addressing these extremely sort of elegiac and, um, you know, inscrutable things like light and grief. And, uh, and I was curious, just in terms of your practice, like, there seems to be this arch of, of, of focusing on these kind of inscrutable things like how, it, how, can you can you talk to that? How have you over the you know from the 90s up until sort of 2012 and I'm, I'm assuming beyond you have been addressing these is this is this something that that you sort of focus on and have always been interested in? Um, you mean grief and loss and Grief, loss, but then, you know, I feel like light and the, the, the sort of the idea of this Oculus, you know, I'd like to talk more about that particular fascination because it is this kind of emptiness, right? And in architecturally, you look up and it is very kind of jarring. It's just a hole. And, and then it's kind of reproduced in these hands as well. And I was, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, Nick, I'm making work and then it's so interesting to have Ksenia or, or, you know, curator to come and put things together and kind of reimagine them, you know, re, you know, bring a life and put this friendship and, um, you know, associations together. Um, but, you know, my, my interest in that Pantheon building was very deep and very like, I kind of fell in love with this building. I think there's a term for that, you know, there's, there's the Oculus. So, and it was also like this concept that, you know, they built this thing, however many thousands of years ago, was it 2000? And um, it's still there, you know, and it's still one of the most incredible spaces to enter and my imagination and my, you know, I was going there on, with the woman who was a, was a, um, you know, she studied the stars and the light, you know, so this this concept of a building with a hole and the light and the emperors and the whole, you know, spotlight on the gods, really, um, it just captured me for a long time. Um, obviously, you know, when you're in Rome, you're kind of, you know, your, your sense of an artist is very much, put in the history you're like okay well I just sort of take it all in while I'm here because making work is very um you know you're up against history in such a profound way but um so these Nick I made sorry Will I made when I got back 
and they were this kind of like how over time you know we're still kind of we really do the same thing of inquiry and you know just making things with our hearts and minds and hands and this was a real sort of continuum of that idea just the hand with this you know the eye or the mouth or and you know i can't say that i'm like you know death or loss is my subject mm. but i am very interested and i have a sort of side gig where i'm a i have been a carer for the dying you know which is a very beautiful and profound thing to be i mean you know i'm not talking about the aids crisis which was a very different process of dying i'm talking about caring for people in my life who are older and dying. So um, I think that this curation of this show really put this in a certain context, you know, mm. that it was a beautiful sort of coming together of all this work that kind of puts the body in, in the building, like when I walked in that gallery to see our show, because I hadn't been there for the install, it's like the, the body is so present, you know, and the lack of the body or the absence, uh, the presence and the absence of our friends who were there and gone in instance, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that through Ksenia's kind of curation, it it just took on a whole nother, these pieces in particular, the handprints in particular, took on a certain punctuation and sort of continuity of um, both my ideas around, you know, the continuity of making things from antiquity to now, you know, and then um, just kind of sharing sharing that like you said you know mourning love and friendship in that gallery mm. was um was very pleasant but then sort of correlative that to that to that the glass rods which predate your going to rome and doing the rome project yeah. really have a very very similar uh i feel like they're almost like extrusions of of the oculus i mean what was the mm -hmm. What's this, what is the story of the, of the glass rods? You know, I was, I was working with reflected light, mm. which was just seeing light as a reflection with the paper hanging pieces that were painted on the backside, they reflected light. And I was really interested in trying to take light into a form. And this was my representation of just, light as empty and form. Mm. And I think that they can, I think they kind of morph as to who's looking at them. And they kind of repel you because they feel fragile and they feel like they take up this kind of strange aura space or something. Mm. So that's the other thing with a lot of this work in the gallery is this there is a sort of um space around them or something that is um active like these are active because you have to be careful where you're walking you know to some it's extent very, yeah it's, it's wonderful to think that you that that's actually planned in a way you know because it's the first thing you think when you see them is like, oh, they're the glass rods have to don't kick them and don't make them roll. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and well, then the, yeah. the, 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 the spaces between was such a process piece as well. Very, um, you know, it was like, I was saying to Ksenia at some point, it's like the opposite of taking a photograph where you have to actually get bodies together and ask them to, you know, get up close, put this smudge between you and stay there for 20 minutes 
so it was a very intimate, demanding process and asking people to, um, you know, really commit their time. And um, I was remembering this morning, actually, that I was also studying geology at the time that I went up to City College and um, I got very interested in geologic time and us as human beings in that time. So I, I just was, you know, I was sort of thinking of these pieces as fossils and, um, you know, even the time it takes to make them is kind of, um, I mean, it's not geologic, but it's, it's the opposite of one second on Instagram. And then I think as a counterpoint to that, Linda, the use of, of wax and mesh um, to construct these sort of vessels, like vessels that can never, you know, that are not contiguous. Um, and then using the wax in the, in the drawings as well. Um, what, when did you begin to work with the wax and construct these forms out of them, out of it, out of that material? Um, well, I've always been, I mean, wax is uh, there's actually Nick. There's actually a, I wanted to comment before I will answer you. I promise. But there's a shot of that piece with the with the the pair, the hanging piece. There's I wanted to sort of say something like an installation shot of those two pieces sort of together. Yeah, there we go. Um, so it was really. Um, uh, moving for me to see the um, sh the wall, Siobhan's wall piece and uh, the hanging uh, pair, it's called pair, pair, the hanging pair um, together because when I moved on a little from the, from the goodbye to all my drag queens at the, the all like working with, with that one, <laughs> With the with that series, um, I started making these uh, uh, vessels, these sort of like ideas of like, you know, um, this sort of like gathering. You know, we gather things um, both physically and metaphorically between people and the and you know or people that we know and the, our energies and um, and there was one of the things that the you know the AIDS uh, crisis was really came, is that you can't hold, you can't sort of hold this tangible thing is like a myth. And so there were these like, I, these vessels that you really couldn't contain anything. And I was really fascinated between that and fascinated between the energy and space between um, people. And um, this piece, when the two were, like paired, I just thought it was kind of amazing it um, because the the energy between the two uh, vessels that the the shape that's there, which is always the thing that I'm fascinated with, the the, the space between, um, and Siobhan had this tangible piece that was the space between, and I just thought that it was so beautiful together. It was because it was like, it was the same, but different. And I, um, I just thought that was a sort of great kind of moment for me. And I think for other people to come and experience and um, sort of like amazing to have, a, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't know Kesnia before um, any, I didn't know this was happening. Um, and so <laughs> that someone was interested in the work from, from that time period. And so, you know, the vision to have this together, however it came about was, I just thought a very beautiful moment. And um, I like when those little sort of secret moments happen. So it was so magical. And that, that's what's so beautiful about art that it, it just has this way of, being magical in the when you least expect it or can remember it and I don't know it's so poetic very beautiful kind of moment 
Um, so to go back to your question, well, I didn't mean to not answer it. Um, I, I, I have a real sort of like pared down aesthetic, both in the studio and in my life. Um, uh, and uh, I basically use three materials and have used those three materials since I started making things. And um, so wax, graphite, and wire, uh, wire in the sculptures, but um, in my drawings, it's graphite and wax on paper. And so the sculpt, it's, it's just the materials that I have around. And I guess I have them around because I just find them captivating. Uh, and and I, I just never seem to be um, bored by them. And um, I just like the idea that I, you know, one moment I feel like I can't do anything more with these materials and then something happens. And I think that's just, um, just, uh, it's the thing that, I, it's the material that, you know, your materials as an artist, I mean, it's the, it's a tool, right? It, it's the tools that you use to, to make your mark. Um, and um, I, I, you know, I just, I, those are my, those are my things that I'm captivated by, I guess. The wax is typically, I mean, at least in sculpture, it's sort of an intermediate material between idea and sort of then the solid, you know, mm -hmm. eternal object. So it's it's very it's kind of wonderful when when sculptors use wax because you can watch it almost change to a, to a, a very a, a small extent. When did you begin to like what what attracted you to wax? Like how did you when did you start with that? Was that in school or or just did some was there a sort well, of an I, yeah I um well I didn't go to college so mm -hmm. I didn't have like an experience of um. I don't know, you know, classes about materials or anything. Um, and I think that wax captivated me because it just, I, it was so, I think I probably saw, you know, Jasper John's paintings and I didn't, because I didn't really, I think I understood, it wasn't paint and yet he was making paintings. And so I kind of like liked, I didn't know at the time. There, I mean, we were talking like a long time ago. Um, you know, I didn't. I didn't know how to put things together. I just saw something. I read a wall label. I was like, "Oh, okay." You know, you can start doing things with these materials. And um, I don't really know the very, very beginnings of it. It's just a material I've always had around. I think the smell of these waxes seductive and um you know i like sexy things i guess you know i don't know like, um and um graphite is so beautiful it's just such a beautiful material and it you know it's it's alive and it it um it uh i'm very just drawn to how these things go together because in, in a, it's a funny way they shouldn't go together, but they I sort of push them to go together, and that that I that the energy between things is oh it, like the energy between two objects, the energy between materials, between the people, that sort of spirit of how these things come together. Um, I I just like that synergy. Mm. And there's a tension too. There's a great deal of tension. Yeah. Um, it's very gritty and the objects hang and you feel like they can move, but they're not, you know, it's, and the drawings have captured that as well. You know, it's very, a great deal of material tension. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, both Siobhan and, and, and Linda have been talking about the sort of the, the comparisons and the, you know, like the work pair and the work pause next to each other. So Cassinia, uh, comment on on laying out the show and and how you created these kind of dialogues between the artists. How did how did you <clears throat> do that? 
So full disclosure, um, because it all came together so quickly and um, because, you know, many of these works and, and, and the way that I studied um, Linda's body of work and Siobhan's body of work was very much in fragments. So it wasn't so much me saying, I want this work for the show, where is it? And I want this work, where is that? It was me asking, what do you have? <laughs> what is available, what is in New York, um, with, with the exception of uh, Goodbye to All My Drag Queens, which you know we have on loan. Um, but I mean, Siobhan and I went through her storage together and it, that was such a beautiful experience, I have to say, of, of just physically pulling out works and, and, and from the 90s and looking at them and thinking you know, how they, could go in the show and 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 then while being there also thinking of Linda's work and knowing what Linda had uh, and having done studio visits with Linda and so it was like it was a very quick process uh really in the span of three weeks um and I and then I compiled a list of the work and I sat down to write the essay that's the press release. And I was kind of worried because this whole time, I, I always say I'm a bad art historian because I'm more interested in the stories and the people and less in the artwork. So I kind of forget <laughs> about the artworks. Um, and, but I just knew that once it came together, it would make sense. And so then, when I sat down to write the essay and I was looking at the images of the pieces, it just, it was such a nice process of writing it as well. And, but it also made me insanely nervous actually to show Linda and Siobhan and because I'm a confident writer usually. And that, oh my God, I finished the essay and I just, I just felt like a kid. I felt so sensitive about it because I've dedicated eight years of my life to, to studying this work and, and you know this period and these artists and getting to work with Linda and Siobhan. It just, you know, more than <laughs> my conversations with them really validated who I am as an art historian, you know, and, and it was a really beautiful experience. And, and it, it, you know, both of these people, I, this is so, <laughs> gonna sound so cheesy, but really changed my life. And we think of changing someone's life as, as being something like a big event or a big gesture, but just these very tiny, subtle, ways of engaging with these two artists it was just and it all made sense this was such an effortless process and working with Candace as well and the installation it just all was a curator's dream really had the work ever been seen together before in any context no I know that Siobhan and Linda were in a big group show together that Linda uh co-organized with Nancy Brooks Brody, who is one of the founding members of Pierce Pussy, uh, another incredible lesbian artist. And that was like, I, I, I didn't see it. It was what, 2000, early 2000s. Um, and their works weren't together or anything, but they were both in the show. I was so um, excited when this was presented as a possibility. Um, Siobhan and I knew each other back then, but we weren't particularly close. It wasn't like we were in and out of each other's studios or, you know, it was like a circle of people that kind of all knew of each other kind of thing. And, um, you know, I'd seen, I'd been a fan of Siobhan's work and I saw some of these pieces in the time, right? Like, or ones of the genre in the time that they were made at the uh, gallery that 
she was showing with at the time. And, um, you know, I just always thought they were so poetic and beautiful and I never really connected it so much to what I was working on and at, 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 at the time. And so when this came together, it was such a, um, it's like, oh my God, of course, like, wow. Like to see the big folded drawing with um, some of the bronzes. I mean, it was really like, there's such a dialogue um, between the work and I, you know, aside from being the artist in the show, I think if I would have like just walked in and seen this, um, I just think it's it's a it's a beautiful pairing, and I I'm just so it made me, it made me so happy to see this work that was all you know so like you know emotional. So so um, yeah, it's super cool. I mean. What is you, both both you, Linda and Siobhan, what is your relationships with this body of work? I know some of it is obviously more recent, some of it is older, but uh, you talked about not having seen it in a long time. Is this, is it, is it very painful to see it or are you happy to see it? How, as artists, I know sometimes artists look back and they say, well, that was a period I don't think about very often. That's a period I think about all the time. How has this been in that way? I mean, it's obviously quite a joyful relation, you know, sort of reunion in a way. But on the other hand, you know, how was the work received when it was made? How do you feel about it? Is there bitterness? Is there how? What is your general sense of this work from the from the nineties? Um, I think um, I think when you make work, when you put it away, and it's like mm, that's done, and I said to. Ksenia, I said, I, you have to come because I walk into my storage and I get paralysis and I walk mm -hmm. out again. I'm like disinterested. I don't want to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think other, I mean, I know other artists have that too. It's just like, that's done. It's, so she came and, but once she came, I was really into digging stuff out and finding it. And, um, It is a sort of reunion. It, it, I don't feel like I have specific relationships to it, but I feel, um, you know, it's like somebody bringing a new sense to it for me. And I just want to add as well that Ksenia, meeting her has really changed my life in a big way and how she has really, you know, this, her dissertation and this kind of lesbians on the periphery is a profound thing, you know? It's like, she's really bringing life back to people who have, you know, been sort of abandoned for a while, you know? And, um, it's an it's a it's an amazing thing that she's doing, and I feel very, um, I feel revivified by her. You know, my work is, I'm so in love with this show. I think it's a beautiful thing, and um, and I'm really happy to see my work and Linda's work. You know, you you think things in storage are like done and dusted it's over there it's finished but to, for somebody to really pull it out is a beautiful offering and I'm incredibly touched and there's no bitterness <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I you know I don't it, it, I think it's a I think it's I think an, I think um artists are for me, well, speak for me, sort of, I think it's very uh, lucky and um, moving to be able to be alive to see your work from so long ago um, and have it, I mean, one of the things I think that's so important is that 
um, Ksenia is actually contextualizing the work. Um, and that was something that at the time I wasn't afforded. Like that didn't happen for me. The work sort of either got made and got sold or got made and got put in a box in storage and, or, you know, went into a collection and sat in that storage. Like, and it, oh, there wasn't, uh, there weren't a lot of, there wasn't a contextualization of the work. And I think what's so interesting now is that it's happening and how I think, um, I think that it, it feels like, I do, I feel like kind of so grateful that somebody's doing this um, and it's, and that I'm, a, I'm here to experience it is, kind of amazing and um i had i had to also pull some work that i didn't even know existed out of storage some that didn't make it into the exhibition and i had it up in my in the studio um and it was working on something else and so i had some more recent sculptures around and so there was this kind of mix of older things from the 90s and recent works and drawings that i'm working on and it was this but what, what, one of the things that's amazing to be able to see is the, the, the breadth of the work as an artist, to be able to have that moment where you can sort of see this, you know, your, your, your journey in a way and um, how much the older works relates to the newer work and um, how it's all there. You know, our, our mark, our language that both I think Siobhan and I, it, it's there, you know, and it, it almost doesn't, there's a funny thing about like uh, my drawings about people always want to know the dates of them. And sometimes the dates are a little bit like, who knows really, you know, it's kind of like the date it goes out of the studio. It's the early stuff's kind of dated and then it, does that I stop dating and then I change the dates, which is probably like a registrar's and curator's nightmare, but I change the dates on things and, you know, so, but the breadth of an honest work to be able to experience it, I think I feel so fortunate. It's such a fortunate experience to be able to, to you know, to, to have that moment with it to see that and to experience it. And um, that's, yeah, I just wanna say that it's a very fortunate experience. And the, the vitrine that um, is been really fun. People like send me pictures, people who go see the show, snap pictures of it and send me funny little memories of other parts of that photograph. <laughs> so that's funny. Ksenia, um, just, the, you know, obviously, you know, that you've been working on this for eight years, but as, as Siobhan said, you know, lesbians on the periphery, this is, is not the, you know, main narrative of the AIDS epidemic in, in New York and elsewhere. What has been your experience, you know, writing this project and collecting uh, data and evidence and talking to people? I mean, has it been an uphill battle? Have people kind of embraced it, embraced the narrative? What has been your, you know, your personal uh, experience with this project? Um, so I will say, so yeah, the dissertation is, the whole point was to, to provide this other narrative, right, of the story of participants that have have gone unnoticed. Um, and when I first started, because I, I came to NYU, I moved here from the Netherlands, I came to NYU to do a master's. And then I stayed for the PhD and I already started this research during my master's. And I remember when I first started reaching out to artists, some artists said no, you know, and they didn't want to do an interview. And what, why, I, why? either because it was, you know, it was too emotional or because, you know, 
who am I? I'm just like a master's student. Can I interview you? I was so young and naive, you know, I thought everybody would just want to talk to me because I'm writing about lesbians. And, um, and then I realized that, you know, I also had to put in more work and um, do more research. And um, as I, as I wrote more and researched more and published more, I started noticing that I had a better sense of how to reach out to people and what questions to ask. And um, much of the dissertation is centered around oral histories that I did. Um, and it became, yeah, a really, a really beautiful process. Um, and then some of the artists I became friends with. Um, and, and it's definitely been an uphill battle because I remember when, when I first started researching this, um, people didn't, I mean, I remember everybody knew who Fierce Pussy was, uh, that was great. Uh, and then, but other than that, people weren't so interested in this topic. And then Art Aids America, the exhibition happened and, um, and there was a series of exhibitions related to the AIDS crisis. And then of course the Stonewall shows. Um, and yeah, I definitely noticed that there was more and more interest in my topic. So it's been a, it's been a good, it's been a good project. And do you do you have any questions you want to ask the artists? I mean, you've been have a, there are things do you want things that you want to pick you know pick their minds about? What are you? Um, you know, I feel like maybe this is because I I am so privileged in having access to them. Uh, I was you know I was curious what they thought when I first proposed the show, but I feel like they kind of answered that already. And. Uh, um, so if we have questions from the audience, maybe um, maybe let's prioritize that, and then I can always ask more. Sure, Nick. Sure. Um, well, I, firstly, I I want to thank you all so much for such a wonderful conversation, an important conversation today, and congratulations on the exhibition. We encourage everyone to go see the show if you can in New York. Um, we've gotten a quite a few questions from the audience. So uh, I'll, to get started, I'm going to pass the microphone first to Lydia. Uh, Lydia, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I had a question for Linda. Um, when you were speaking about the um, goodbye to all my drag queens piece, you spoke about um, how your work moved a little bit more away from directly referencing loss. And I was just wondering if you could go into more of what that process was like um, and from a less direct route and how those themes transform or inform new work and also just like what the relationship of time was to that process for you. Um, I think that, um... Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, sculpture was something that kind of came by surprise. I actually started out as a kind of terrible painter and um, I didn't even think for some reason that I could be a sculptor. I don't know, it was just like, I made drawings and from, I always made drawings. Drawings were something <clears throat> Did from like when I was really little, like, you know, I just drew. Um, and then I guess because of that, I thought I should be a painter. And then I, you know, painted, my paintings were terrible. And I wound up sort of making weird things and screwing them onto the paintings. And at some point um, I realized that, you know, a friend of mine who was an artist who, um, who uh, uh, um, a male, uh, a gay male artist, Bob, Bob Carver, um, came over to the studio and pulled one of the things off the, the painting and put it on the floor and said, that's the most interesting thing here. And, uh, you know, it was shocking. And, you know, he died quite soon after that. Um, and um, he was one of the inner 
friends, a circle of friends that died. And somehow that I started making things, I, he somehow gave me permission to make things three dimensionally. And I started doing that. And those, even though I was still drawing, the sculpture kind of had a life of its own. It, people came over and put the sculpture in exhibitions. And all of a sudden I was Linda Madelana sculptor, but I was like, wait, I'm not, re I'm really, a, I make drawings, you know? Um, but it was really hard to get people just to look at drawings. You know, drawings didn't have the cachet that it ha they have now. Like it wasn't its own thing. And um, so I made sculpture and um, the sculpture really, I was so new at the medium and what I was doing. And they, they all of us, you know, they became, they were very, body referential, so much so that anything was written about them at the time was about this sort of like, you know, decaying body, you know, and I, 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 because abstraction was always the thing that I was sort of drawn to, I had to figure out a way how to make that shift. And um, I also thought it, like, abstraction opened the world up for me more, and I think I believe for you know other people looking, it, it was it was it, it was a bigger vista, you know, and um, I I had to sort of pull away for a while making sculpture, and then I kind of came back to it, but I didn't want it to be so body referential. I had to I had to really work at figuring out what my mark was going to be and what my what how I was going to do that and it, it took a lot of time I mean you know you it it, it 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 just took a lot of it took time and time is you know that's that's what it you know time working like just putting in the work to pull the work back into I wanted to be more in control of the narrative and um uh so it, it kind of moved to the gathering and protecting series. I stopped titling the works so specifically. Um, and then I stopped making sculpture for a long time and worked just on drawing. And um, just sort of recently, the past like, I don't know, five years or so making sculpture again. Um, and uh, kind of, it feels, it was really after coming back to the studio after like lockdown that I kind of came back into the studio and started really pushing making sculpture in a way that I hadn't made it since way back in the 90s it, with that kind of like, um, but yet with all the things that we've learned like that I've learned in your emotional life and um, in the, the, like, having a kind of more secure feeling of who I am and what I wanna make enabled me to change the, the work. And I've just been always someone that just kind of did my own thing, you know, I, I just kind of, that's, for me, the truth of what you're making is the most important thing. And everything else is just everything else, right? <laughs> you know, everything else meaning, you know, success, money, review, all that stuff, that's different. It, as an artist, you have to sort of like follow your truth. Thank you, Linda. Um, and thank you so much, Lydia, for that question. Um, next, I'm gonna pass it over to our good friend, G.E. Schwartz. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, question for Saban and, and Linda. Could you talk a bit about how the work of subtlety in, in these makings that you make 
um, how it conjures and captures our many spiritual, uh, this corporate maybe elements of our states of being? Shiv, you want to take this or? Yeah, you can talk about Buddhism. I think George, you're kind of answering the question. <laughs> you're seeing what you're seeing, right? Like the perception of a person is their own like we're all viewing the world through our own eyeballs, like we are projecting our worlds. And um, perhaps what's out there is not even real. It's just you looking at the world. So um, even with that concept, like I can talk about subtlety as like, um, how do, I deal with my thoughts, right? How do I, how do I wake up in the morning, and what's what's my projection of where I'm going to go today? You know, um, I tend to. I'm a very lucky person because I I'm out of the city right now in nature, and that is something that informs me on every level, and I'm very grateful to be here. Um, subtlety is perhaps being the looker, the onlooker, the bystander, taking it in, um, taking the time, having trust, not knowing what you're doing, not caring what people think, being present for your practice, trusting your own instincts, having space in your mind to allow what you don't know to happen, you know? That's my answer. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, next, I am going to pass the mic to uh, Marie in the audience. Marie, you can turn your mic on now. Hi, this is uh, for Linda, also about the Vax. I would like to know if you feel you have any sort of dialogue with Poltec and if you have chosen, it seems to me all your works are works that are very easy to leave traces in, the paper and the wax. And I wanted to hear if maybe you think that these materials have a capability to express vulnerability that painting doesn't have. Um, yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, I, well, I think there are many paintings that actually express vulnerability. Um, um, I just wasn't able to make those. Um, I think that I, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I am not sure how to go about answering it. The materials are, um, I think that being an artist is just sort of like laying yourself open for vulnerability. I mean, I, I think that's the edge that I walk on. Um, and I think the materials that I choose are just, the materials that for whatever reason, I mean, I, 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 for whatever reason, when I was a very young artist, were the materials that were either at hand or that, that kind of like mystical or spiritual way that the materials choose you. And then your choice is to, your job is to then to become the master of those materials so that you have the control to let yourself, to let want, want, be vulnerable enough to make the work. I mean, it's, it's sometimes making work is scary. Right? Yeah. It's not like, you know, go have a good time in the studio. Like that, that's not my story <laughs> at all. Um, and um, I, 
I just, you know, hope that, you know, you put, you make the work and then you put it out there in the world and you don't know what happens. And that's, the only thing I know is that I did the best that I could do with that piece of work. And I felt enough to put it out into the world. And what happens after that is the mystery of art, isn't it? You know, like, yeah. I have something to add actually. Just from an art, art historical perspective, I will say that I did discuss Linda's work in relation to Paul Thack. And just in terms of, you know, Kristeva's essay on the abject became so popular when it was translated in 89. And then in 93, the Whitney did this big show on abject art. And so I talk about how these, you know, abject visual sensibilities um, gain new meaning really during the AIDS crisis and in relation to the failing body and you know not just Paul Peck, uh, Kiki Smith, Bob Gober, um, so many other artists but yeah so that was actually that was that was part of part of the narrative so I'm, I'm happy you I'm happy you asked that question. I, I have I, one of the, my very early experiences one of the first exhibitions that I was ever I was one, a small drawing was put in an exhibition that Simon Watson curated. He had a little space down on like Lafayette Street near the old, near the Firehouse Museum or something. It was a tiny little show. And I don't remember the name of it. Um, and and my, I was so excited. My drawing was hanging in the exhibition and right in front of it was a Paul Tech Vitrine piece. And I, I thought I had like, that was it. Like I made it. I was like, and my piece was like, you know, right. I, I you know, that was so exciting. And, and yeah, I love that work. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. Thank you, Marie, for that question. Um, I'm going to read a question that came in from someone in the audience, but had to leave. Uh, so asked I could read it on their behalf. Um, but I believe this connects to um, Siobhan. Um, but the question is, one of the handprints immediately to me recalls the Hamsa, a symbol in both Muslim and Jewish mystical traditions used for protection from evil. It is also a symbol of mystical healing. And the work here is reminiscent of Joseph Boy's in the fragments and implied image. Is it a certain alchemical healing in response to the failures of medical healing? It's a lot there, but I, I think maybe Siobhan, if you wanna take that first. I think yes. I love direct answers. <laughs> I'll put a yes on that. <laughs> Um, I don't think I'm in control of those things that are bigger than us, you know, they're like subjecthood that we connect to. Um, I wasn't referencing, um, it's that hand, right, that with the eye, yeah, um, but obviously there's continuity there and I like that reference, I'm like, I'm liking that. I'm being told that, so that's good. Um, but I did feel there was a healing in the show just coming together from, you know, seeing it together and having just memories of friendships and things that were happening between us, between Linda and I, between the people I was working with, you know, so it does feel like really coming full circle and having real sort of meaningful, um, I don't know if healing is the word, but just gathering, you know, like we're back gathering and we have a kind of memory place in there with that, yeah. Thank you for that beautiful response. Um, I believe for our final question, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Carolyn. 
Hi, um, thank you guys so much um, for such a rich conversation. Um, we were all just wondering about the materials in the vitrine piece, um, if you could speak a bit more about those materials and just how and um, why that's uh, present um, in the show. That's, that, that's a work of art by me. <laughs> cool. I made it. I, from the start, I was like, I, I, really, I really want to have archival materials in the exhibition. But I also, I did feel like, I felt like I was already asking so much from Siobhan and Linda. Um, and then to also be like, can I go through your personal photo album and pick out some photos and just throw it into a vitrine? Uh, it felt like a lot to ask. And so actually, initially, I had let the idea go. And I was like, okay, this will be for 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 next exhibition. Yeah, it's not a big space also. But then like two days before the show i i had i had some sort of dream and i woke up from the dream and i called candace and i said we gotta have the vitrine and uh candace being candace um said okay we're gonna we can totally do it where i'll order this thing right now then we ordered this custom made plexiglass and these acrylic cubes to go on top and uh siobhan had already given me some archival material from when I visited her upstate and then um and we have like a we have a text thread and sometimes she sends me a photo of a photo <laughs> and so I went through those and I printed some of those and then uh Linda brought in brought in some archival material that I had actually already digitized in the past for my dissertation and um I just put it together and I think what's really interesting is, is just the language um, that emerges from all these materials. So that um, like the thing that you see that reads this blood, that blood is a, is a book that Siobhan did with John Bringley in 98. Um, and then, you know, there's uh, next to it on the right is an exhibition that Linda was in in 97 curated by Amy Capalazzo. And then on the left from that, there's a show by Siobhan that's titled Curious About Existence, which is just such a good description of her work. And then I think above it is something that's like presence and absence. And so you just, you really, you don't even have to see the show, <laughs> just the narrative emerges from the retreat alone. Um, but yeah, so it was really, it was just like an art historian thing. I really wanted to have to have archival material. And I, I do think that, you know, in exhibition, in many of the exhibitions that I that I enjoy today, there is a certain a certain certain trend of archival material, you know, in the Barbara Hammer show at Company Gallery, <clears throat> the Ron Athey exhibition. Um, and uh, I always really appreciate it. And so I knew that other people uh, would appreciate this too, and they have. Well, thank you so much, Ksenia, for that. And thank, thank you, you, Carolyn, for asking. Um, thank you, everyone in the audience, for asking questions. Um, and once again, I just want to thank you, Siobhan, Ksenia, and Linda, for joining us today and for everything that you've done uh, for this important gathering and important healing. Uh, but we have a tradition here at the rail uh, for our own community events that we close with a poetry reading. And I am thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Ty Cooper, to the stage. Ty Cooper is a Brooklyn-based writer who works in experimental prose, poetry, and digitality. They maintain a focus in the treacheries of autonomous hands, outer space, and AI. They graduated from Pratt Institute in 2021 with a BFA in writing and are currently working on a hybrid novel. So, uh, Ty, over to you. Thank you so much, Nick. And thank you, uh, Will and Linda and Ksenia and Siobhan for this conversation today. I am so honored to even be in a Zoom room with you all and um, in the sake of honesty, and I'm always honored to be among lesbians. So, <laughs> um, uh, in the spirit of, fragmentation and uh, the failures of a body. 
Um, the first piece that I'm going to read is a, a fragmented one called Clips from a Notebook. Thursday, February 4th, 2021. I had a dream that my ideas of home faded in the wash. No date. If I evade things forever, I will be tired of writing them before I've ever told anyone. I feel like I'm holding a story inside me that I want to tell everyone, but no one really cares and I'm already tired of telling it. Make something, show no one. No date. The system creates the glitches which break it. No date. I hear the sound of the weight of a body or its items crash to the floor above me. This followed by the tumble of bare feet to my left. Kale is only barefoot when he is sleeping or swimming. I open my door after placing my book face down, feeling the bookmark clatter out. I look upwards and I watch him monitor the stairs via his reflection in the framed pomegranate print Emmy made during our freshman year when neither of us lived in this house. He goes back to his room. No date. I forget that anyone has ever touched the artwork. No date. Dear editors, my name is Ty and I'm excited to submit word count. I sincerely hope it finds its home with you. Thank you. No date. None of these words would be here if not for the people who remind me that I exist. Thank you. No date. I think I've got a hundred pictures of you on this rock, posing, turning around with, faking an excuse. My whole life she went to a planet, but then pretend that grocery bag Nike too smooth on rough concrete, tarmac, blacktop gravel pavement, dog rustle, two of the same, Russian dolls of each other. My name is Daisy, flip flops fly high, hi, hey. Pretend you recognize me. Three, two, one, and then in unison, October 1st, 2010. Tuesday, November 9th, 2021. Happy birthday. Thank you for filling the house with Pharaoh and footsteps. I'm sorry, I don't know how to write a non-corny birthday card. Love you. Monday, November 15th, 2021. What should the first person to set foot on Mars say upon doing so? And that's clips from a notebook. Um, <laughs> and then... Um, I'm going to read uh, one more piece, and this one will be uh, in the April issue of the Brooklyn Rail, which will be live on web tomorrow. Um, and this is called, I couldn't have John Cusack, so I bought the coat myself. Look at this crazy photo I took of my arm. Doesn't it look broken? But mommy, watch, this one is dangerous for us. We'll read it together. Is that a boy or a girl? The puppy in the book or my own finger pointed back at my taped down chest. You're going to let your kid take this one, right? I want to blame you for living near so many queer people and not teaching your kid what it looks like to be more than either or, but I'm too busy negotiating the joys and pitfalls of a brand new visibility and telling you your total with tax. I've been trying to write this poem about my shadow becoming a man before I do and the way that I've been scared of the image of him that follows me around. It's hard to put into words what it's like to feel yourself becoming something you aren't done being scared of yet. I ask my brothers where they buy their boxers, and I want to ask if they ever catch their reflection in the deli window and slide their house keys between their knuckles. Jam on sourdough toast with coffee, leftover wonton soup and a bowl of honey bunches of oats, a chicken burrito. I've been having all these dreams about kids with dietary restrictions and tsunamis. I cry from the wind, late to meet Kale at the park. I touch the tear where it falls and look at my hand where it's wet, checking for something. This morning, I've paid my rent and brushed my teeth and I can't remember my dreams. I cry nearly the whole time and no time else. I wake up to my alarms feeling that I was meant to get a set of books for someone bound by rubber bands. Two donuts, one for breakfast, one for dinner, a meatball sub, four slices of pineapple. I cry, listening to Elvis and looking at my shadow in the 3 p.m. light. It looks like me when I was eight, the first haircut. 
I remember the day at camp when Brad Adair thought I was a boy when I was wearing the yellow fleece. I think I slept through the whole night. Thank you. I am so happy to hear applause in the physical room and also here in the virtual room. Um, Ty, thank you so much. And uh, as, as Ty said, uh, our, our, our April issue goes live tomorrow and you can check out Ty's poems in there and a bunch of other great stuff. Um, so thank you for that, Ty. Thank you once again, Siobhan, Linda, Ksenia and Will. We'd also like to thank everyone at Candice Maddie for helping to make today's event possible and also uh, Gordon Robichaud and Cato Wilborn. We encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel where we will upload today's conversation shortly and um, join us tomorrow for a conversation with at 1 p.m. Eastern for a conversation with artist Walton Ford and rail editor at large, Jason Rosenfeld. We will conclude with a poetry reading by Leanne Brown. Uh, and you now can all turn on your microphones as you say farewell and hello and congrats and um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good writing, Ty. Good writing, Ty. Thank you, Ty. It was so good. Thanks, Very interesting. Ty. Thanks. Thank you Pleasure. all so much. And go see yeah. the show. <laughs> yeah, go see the show. April, April 16th. Congratulations. Thank you. Siobhan. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Siobhan Thank and Wendell. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Thank you, Will. That was great. That was My was great, great pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you, Nick. Thank you, William. So, Thank yeah. you, Will. Bye, guys. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.